before going into the coins of Westmead and all of that, just my own in, intro into it. Um, I'm from this county. Uh, my home village is my Vor. My own townland is called, was called Killinurk, long since obsolete, but the postal address is Daly's Town. I believe there's some, er some horrific error in the newspaper that put me somewhere else, but Daly's Town it is, yeah, you're right. Um, and I've always been interested in matters relating to Westmead and Westmead history. And when I had the opportunity of choosing a thesis subject way back in 1972 in UCD, I chose Westmead before the famine. So I did my thesis on Conacre and tenants and crops and cows and the price of oats. And I went into the National Museum and they put me working on Georgian silver. Now, it was social history, but it wasn't the social history of the sort of people I had worked on. It wasn't the social history of my people. But I kept the head down, as one does in the civil service. I got on with it, and I soon got working on the museum's coin collection. And that happened at a very interesting time, because in the early 90s, in the 70s and 80s, there was a huge outburst of um, metal detecting in Ireland and particularly in this county, quite a lot of metal detecting. And coin started to come into me from places that I knew, from townlands that I knew, even from fields that I knew. So you could say I got lucky. I was from the right place, I was in the right place at the right time, and I was working on the right material. So you can't get luckier than that. No. Going from that to our main story here, we have no coins circulating in Ireland before the Viking period. And for the first hundred years or so of Viking Ireland, there were no coins either because the early Vikings didn't use them. From about 900 or thereabouts, increasingly, the Vikings are beginning to use coins, and what they are using are the coins that they are finding in England and Europe. In other words, coins that they are connecting with and trading with. So our first and earliest coin hoards are Viking, and they tend to be coins like Anglo-Saxon coins that the Vikings are bringing in. They haven't started making their own, but they are beginning to use coins. They're coming into Dublin, and when the Vikings arrive in Ireland, uh, the Irish kingdom that they're most, should we say, facing and at loggerhead with, raiding with and trading with, is the old kingdom of Mead. And the ruling dynasty in the old kingdom of Mead was the Clan Coleman dynasty. And their heartland was right here where we are. It was in what is now West Mead, round Loch Gold and Loch Enel, and this part of the old kingdom. And it's interesting that as late as the 17th century, people in West Mead, or in parts of it, still using the Irish language, I uh, have this as a reference somewhere in a journal long since gone out of my head. They referred to themselves as late as the 17th century as Muinther and Shanriot, the people of the Old Kingdom. And uh, Westmead was the heartland, what is now Westmead, and a bit of North Offaly that was poached off us later. Uh, 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 that area of Westmead was the heartland, shall we say, the home stamping ground of the Clan Coleman kings. And in the 10th century, it was the Clan Coleman kings who were pushing the Vikings back and uh, raiding and trading with the Vikings. And it was the Clan Coleman kings who won a big victory over the Vikings at the Battle of Tara, which I think is 780 or, sorry, 980 or 981. And this is long before Brian was even heard of. So uh, this part of Ireland was a very important part of Ireland. It was where wealth was coming to. And the earliest forms of wealth that we have find that include and involve coins is right here on, beside us on Loch Enel. Because one of the earliest Viking Age hordes to include coins is a hoard from Dysert Island on the west side of Loch Enel. There are several, coin, several Viking Age hordes of silver from around Loch Enel, most of them from around Dysert, and one of them from Carrick but the one which includes coins is called Dysert 4, 
and that's our kickoff point. The first and air, one of the first and very earliest coin hoards in Ireland, brought in by the Vikings, found its way from the Viking world to Dublin, and from Dublin uh, into the clan, into the Kingdom of Mead, and down into the heartland of the Clan Coleman uh, home territory, probably taking a stop at Harry's in Kinnegad. Um, the earliest material I say is Viking, and it's a weird mixture. It's Anglo-Saxon coins from England. It's uh, so European coins, and it's coins that the Vikings encountered, sometimes whole continents away, because some of the coins, and the very first example is here in front of you, some of the coins that the Vikings used and brought with them come from the Islamic world, from as far away as modern-day Iraq, Persia, and even Afghanistan. Uh, there were two huge dynasties at the time, Islamic dynasties, called the Abbas... I, I won't bore you with them for too long, but the Abbasids and the Samanids, two great dynasties, one based around Iraq, another one further, a little bit further east. And their coins found their way into Viking possession because the Vikings were great traders who went down the Russian rivers, encountered the Islamic world, brought back coins and other forms of trade to Scandinavia, from Scandinavia to Dublin, and from Dublin all the way to Loch Ennell. And that first coin you're looking at there is an Ab it's a, called a dirham, or a half dirham. It's from the Islamic world. I think it's from the Samanids, which is somewhere in or around the year 900 or thereabouts because the Loch Ennell Horde has been dated by various experts, and I'm not counting myself as one of those, I mean real experts out there, um, to about 905, 907, somewhere around that period. And that coin managed to find its way from Tashkent or some such place all the way to Scandinavia, all the way to Dublin, all the way to Loch Ennell. And I think one of the reasons for my interest in history is not you know, battles and kings and great events, but the side roads, the by roads of history, and how a tiny object over 1,100 years ago found its way from, say, Afghanistan to Dysart. It is a, that's, that's real history. Uh, the script, I obviously don't understand. It's called a Kufic script. It's the, na the nature of the script is called Kufic. Uh, and there are experts in places like Oxford and Cambridge, and there's one in Sweden that I used over years, who can read that script and give you the name of the relevant sultan and give you, give you the date to within a few years. Now, I don't understand that script, obviously. There was very little call for Kufic script round my bore when I was growing up. <laughs> so this is the sort of material that's coming up to us. And there is Loch Ennell in all its glory. And it's enough to, to drive anybody mad. Just look at the sort of stuff we're getting. It's coins and hack silver. So what we're getting is coins as, as an element in silver, along with bits of metal, <coughs> bits of ornaments, bits of uh, things chopped off from other things. So it's not really coins being used as we would use them. They were used as weight initially and as part of bullion hoards. There's over... 40 fragments in the, that Loch Ennell hoard of coins, but it's only about 5% of the weight of the hoard. So you're getting every, every manner of thing. And you can actually see on, on this mix and gather them here, there's Anglo-Saxon coins from York. There's, a, so there's Viking coins from York. There's one or two fragments from the famous English Anglo-Saxon king, Alfred the Great. And there's those coins, one or two coins from Europe, and there's a smattering of coins from the Middle East. And that all found its way somewhere around the year 95, 910, all the way via the Clan Coleman kings or one of their subsidiary families, uh, you know, all, all the way to Dysart Island. And that coin hoard was found, I think, in the late 70s or early 80s. I know it came to my attention, I think, in the mid 80s. Uh, in the National Museum. And uh, it didn't help my eyesight working on that material for several weeks. But th there's a level of expertise out there. A lot of this stuff is not, not necessarily knowing yourself, but knowing the people who know. So I could find out that there's somebody in Oxford who knows one sort of fragment. There's somebody in Cambridge 
who is an expert in some other sort of fragment, and there's a little man behind a desk somewhere in Sweden who can read those Islamic coins. So you get to know the people who know. And uh, that coin hoard was, uh, is of major importance because it's one of the very, very first properly uh, checked out and known Viking Age coin hoards. And it's known in the trade as Dicer 4 to distinguish it from the other Dicer hoards that don't have coins. Uh, the 5P is a little bit later. <laughs> it got in there just as a, for, um, yeah, for relation purposes. The coins we're looking at here are out of this very period. And the one on the top left is a European coin. It's from uh, it's a, Fre a French coin, the top left. The, the others are uh, from Viking York, Viking York and Anglo-Saxon England. I won't go into the vari varieties and sub-varieties because I would send you on asleep. Uh, but uh, that's, that's the sort of material that's coming out of Loch Ennell. Anglo-Saxon, Viking, and, and every other manner of thing. Now, if it's the earliest one, Loch Ennell, but there is also, interestingly enough, uh, <coughs> a Vic, uh, one of those dirhams, those Islamic coins, from a little place not too far from where I grew up, a townland called Donil. And Donil is uh, just east of Ballymore. <coughs> and the, town, in, in the townland of Donil is just east of Ballymore. And there we found, I think in the early 80s, and I think it was from land reclamation, one of those little Viking coins came in as well came in to me in the National Museum in a matchbox. And uh, I, the field was pointed out to me, so I found the field, and I, I think I know the, the remnants of the ring fort where it was actually found. And that coin, again, is, I think, the one that was found out at Donil is mid-10th mid century, a little bit later than Loch Ennell. Yeah, that's a standard Anglo-Saxon coin of the period. Some of them are in fairly good nick, some of them are very readable, and, and some of them are not. So there's a variation in them. I'm just used to throw them up there as examples. Uh, now here you can see um, an Anglo-Saxon king. And you, if you read all those coins from the top center, from the 12 o'clock position. Uh, there's a cross in the top center, and then there's E-A-D, or E-D, or you get E-A-D-M-U-N-D. You will get the names of those Anglo-Saxon kings simply by reading round from the 12 o'clock position. And you can see the E-A-D. I think that's there's Edward. There's a, a range of Anglo-Saxon kings, and they nearly all start with E-A-D, which doesn't help. There's Edward, Edmund, Edwig, Edward. They all start <laughs> with the same sort of legend. And if you read those round and get the name of that king, we have their dates, we know their dates, whether it's 950, 960, 980. So those kinds are very useful dating agents for archaeologists, if nothing else. They're also symbols of economic activity and uh, also of political power. You can, you, know, you can find out to some degree what's going on by uh, looking at those coins. There's a, a beautiful uh, Anglo-Saxon coin, and that again, that one I think is out of either either out of Loch Ennell, or it may be from a, another slightly later hoard from a place called Newtown Low. Newtown Low is between Kilbegan and Terrence Pass on the old Dublin Road. And that leads us on to a, another story. The first one was Loch Ennell. But then in the mid 10th century, we're getting a whole range of little Viking hoards, like coins in fives and sixes and eights, not masses of silver, but fives and sixes, small amounts of silver. And they're coming from ring forts and habitation sites in the middle of Westmeath, far removed from any center of Viking occupation. And if, so they're not being used by Vikings. They're not being put aside as huge wealth. They're being put aside, I would say, for transaction purposes. And it would say to me anyway, that our antecedents over a thousand years ago were maybe a lot smarter than we give them credit for. I think they were probably using coins and using coins in the true sense of the word, probably long before uh, we think they might have done so. Now, those little hordes are coming to us from places such as Newtown Low, which is about 950s, 960s. The second one, 
which has been referred to as the Myvor Horde, is not from Myvor, it's from a townland called Coolgauna. And Coolgauna is just east of Myvor. If you look in the textbooks or in the townland index, they call it Kilgani. There is no such place as Kilgani, it's Coolgauna, and it's east of Myvor. And we found a nice little coin hoard there in fields on a farm that I know. I think I, think I know the actual ring for it. And it dates to around 970s, 980s. We have another hoard, four or five coins, from a place called Bishop's Lock. Bishop's Lock is just south of Castle Pollard. That's about 980s, 990s. We have a great Mullingar hoard from around the 980s, 990s. I don't have much details on it because it was found in 1841, which is way back. And we have a, a hoard from a place called Derry Moor, which is the Mead, West Mead border. I think the nearest large urban centre, if that's the word, would be Kinookan. It's, it's that stretch of country, and it's out of my home patch, but it's Derry Moor. And all those little coins are coming in fours, fives, and sixes. My four, the Coolgowner hoard is five coins. Uh, Newtown Low, four coins. Uh, one from Lock Lane, nine coins. Bishop's Lock, four or five coins. Fours, fives and sixes, all found on habitation sites in areas that have nothing to do with the Vikings. So the, the, the Clan Coleman kings brought a, a lot of wealth back into this part of the world, and a lot of it obviously got distributed into small amounts. But I wouldn't get too carried away in terms of wealth, because those coins that we see there, they are only an insignificant element in the wealth that came into this part of the world. Uh, we found coin, uh, ingots of silver from Dysert, not, not the Dysert, this di another, the same Dysert, but a different find. Some ingots of silver weighing over three kilos each. That's the, almost seven pounds, that's almost half a stone. I've found and seen, I haven't found, I've seen ingots the size of pan loaves that came out of Dysart. So you could put the entire Viking Age coin hoards of Ireland into a few of those in, in, in hoards. The hoard from Carrick on the south side of Loch Ennell has a total of 31 kilos, which is nearly 17 pound, 70 pounds, which I think in old money is about five stone weight. 514, yeah, about five stone away. So there's vast amount of wealth coming into this part of the world, and that is because it was the heartland of the ruling dynasty of the kingdom that was dealing with both, both in raid and trade with Viking Ireland. And that, that's what makes this material interesting, and it's all readable. And you can date this material pretty well, certainly the Anglo-Saxon element of it. Uh, when we get in, uh, up to about 1000, or there about 990s, 1000, the Irish Vikings start using their own coinage. They had been using Anglo-Saxon coinage up to that point. Now they start making their own. And some of the hordes, one of the hordes from Loch Lane, actually has both sorts of coins, the Anglo-Saxon ones and the Vi Dublin Viking ones, in the same hoard. So you, you get a switch over. They probably said, oh, here, Let's make our own. They had access to silver. They were uh, very progressive in terms of trades and crafts. So they started to make their own coinage. And the first coins made in Ireland that we're aware of were made in Dublin by the Viking king, Citric. And you can, if you start reading here, you can see bits of his name. Sometimes N-I... Sometimes they use the term Citric. Sometimes he copies the name of the English king, which provided the prototype for the coins. And it's very hard to know sometimes whether you're looking at an Irish coin or an English coin, because they, weren't, they didn't have the concept of, say, forgery that we have today. They saw something, they copied it. So it's not unusual to find a coin with saying Citric on the front of it, that means Dublin. And you look at the back of it and it says London. And you figure, how does this work? It means that they had dyes and they just bashed coins out. Sometimes you get an Irish front and an English back. You get an English front and an Irish back. And it, it's the, early, the early Viking Age coinage of Dublin it's, it can be difficult enough to sort, to sort it out. Uh, sometimes you will find the name, of the, mint, the name of the moneyer and the mint on the back of it. You know, uh, 
You get somebody, for example, called William, William on D-I-V-E for Dublin or D-O-V-E, D-I-V-E-L-I-N. Dublin can be spelt in several different ways. You will also be finding coins with London, Canterbury, York, Exeter marks on them. So you're getting a mixture of Irish and English coins being found in the same hoards at the same time, up to about the year 1000 or thereabouts. And then after that, increasingly, it's Irish Viking only. They are, we're not sure why, but the English element seems to fade off and we seem to be getting just Irish. As we get into the Viking period at about, say, 1020, 1030, you get variations. Uh, that, that's a reverse or back, and you see two little hands. You get coins in one little hand. I, I'm calling them hands, fingers. I don't know what they are. Um, it could be a toe sprack for all I know, but we're, they're, they're known as hands anyway. And uh, you get coins with one hand, two hand, all sorts of little variations, taking you up into 1020s, 1030s, 1040s. And again, going back to our story, we have material here from... Mullingar, there's a Mullingar hoard from around 1025-50 with material of this kind in it. And there's a small hoard from a place called Tony Own. Tony Own is north of Castle Pollard above uh, on the Meath border. It's near that forest which is now quite popular, Mullock Mean. In that area on the Mead, West Mead border, small find of Viking Edge coins. So we're getting material coming in, not so much as earlier, but right into the 11th century, into this part of the world from material that's uh, minted in Viking Dublin. Uh, and that particular coin there, just something to remember also, the old kingdom of Mead, we say coins of West Mead, but the old kingdom of Mead, uh, this end of it, the good end of it, um, also included bits of South Longford and North and West Offaly, including uh, the two the great monastic sites of Boer and Clonmacnoise who were part of the old kingdom of Mead. And that particular coin we're looking at there, it's called the Lamb of God. And you can see the actual, well, rough idea of a lamb with a cross on its back. That's known as the Lamb of God. It's a Viking uh, motif that was taken from, uh, I think, Western Europe or wherever, and used. And that particular coin has surfaced as part of a hoard in Clonmac Noise, which I handled myself. More of the same, yeah, late Viking. We've just run through them. Very late Viking. As we get really late, the Vikings started striking coins that were so flimsy that they're only hitting them on one side only. You, know, you get a design on one side only, and it comes out, obviously, in reverse on the other side. They're striking very, very flimsy coins. They're called bracteates. I think bractea is the Latin word for a leaf. They're very flimsy, leaf-like coins. And <clears throat> I, I think we've got one or two of those have surfaced with a fine spot marked uh, as Athlone, but I don't have a precise. Athlone is a bit vague, but a few of those have turned up. Well, the Shannon would be a good uh, place to find coins anyway. Go ahead. Ah, so that takes us out of the Viking period, really, because the Vikings, their power gradually diminishes. The Irish kings, including the kings of Mead, gradually push them back, and they're in a, by the 11th, you know, well into the 11th century, they're in a rather subsidiary position. So the next big move is, is uh, the arrival of the Normans. And the early Norman coinage included, very much like previously, you have English coins circulating in Ireland, and you have coins struck specifically in Ireland by the Norman authorities. And the earliest Norman coinage that we have, or one of the earliest, was struck under Prince John. Not, you know, King John before he became a king. So he's Prince John. And you're looking at about 1190s. And that coin there is one of a, a we found a number of coins, several coins, with a, and I remember finding it on an old envelope, but at Lone County, Westmead. Now, I don't have it more precise than that, except it's obviously on the Westmead side of the, the, the shop. We'll, ta we'll take it anyway. It's at Lone County, Westmead. And those are little halfpennies of Prince John. And they're really interesting little fellas because that particular Prince John, there are t for numerous varieties of that particular face. Some of them he's smiling, some of them he's grumpy, some of them he looks more like Mona Lisa, you don't know what, what he's feeling. But they're love there must be 20 or 30, 40 different little varieties and sub-varieties. Now, 
I don't want to, as I said, send everyone to sleep, but they're, they're, lo they're really visually, considering you're looking at the 1190, those are lovely little, those are lovely little fellas to have in your hand. That's the, the back of the same coin, I think. Um, they will also tell you, DWE, um, they will also tell you the on the back the name of the money or the man who struck the coin and where he struck it. So you could have something like Robert of Dublin would be R O B E R D of D W E or D I V E. Dublin can be spelled in do lots of different ways. I think that particular Dublin there is D W E. Yes. His name is Robert, as far as I remember. If you stop top center, R-O-D-B-E-R-T, Robert, O-N, on, on means of, Robert of Dublin. So that coin was struck by Robert of Dublin and ended up in, in Athlone in County Westmead somewhere before the year 1200. That's what I, I was saying earlier. There's an infinite variety of those little fellas and uh, some of them are happy and some of them are sad. He, that looks like a Monday morning job. But it, and that's the back, the back of the same coin, and it's also a Dublin coin, DWE. And that moves us to the next phase. We move on sharpish. Uh, those coins were found, I think that particular coin may have come into us uh, from, I think out around Ballymore. Um, John, as King of Ireland, he's moved on now and he's promoted himself, a bit like the present lad. Um, and the Irish coins are very significant at this period in that over all of Europe, most of Europe, Irish, the coins are being minted and struck with the king's head in a circle, which makes perfect sense since coins were circular. But the Irish coins are different. Under Prince John, his successor, Henry III, Edward I, Edward II, for almost 150 years, the head of the ruling monarch on the Irish coins was struck in a triangle the Owl Triangle, and it, sig it, it immediately signifies out, if you're looking at a hoard of obscure coins and you're trying to figure out dates or types, if you see a triangle, it's Irish. And that's a, that's a coin, a, a penny or halfpenny of John, and if you look at the top, top right, I-O-H-N, you can see a bit of John starting to happen. And R-E-X, Rex, John as king, he is now king. And that coin, uh, I think, it's one of a type of a number, small number of coins that we found from, I think, out on Ballymore. I have the townland gone out of my head now. And on the back of the triangle, the other feature, which is distinctively Irish, the triangle is back there again. But within the triangle, you have the sun, moon, and stars, which is a nice idea. You see the moon at the bottom? Crescent moon, a little sun, and some stars. The sun, moon, and stars. It's a motif that has been associated with the Crusades. I'm not sure how safe that is, but I've seen it associated with the Crusades. But, uh, so King John striking coins for Ireland, mostly, mostly in Dublin, but also in Limerick. And um, the, the motif is a, a triangle. With the, the, with the pointy bit and then flat, 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 flat base and point, point upwards. Also, from this period, the, uh, now this particular one is uh, it's just, I know it's from the county, but I don't know where. Um, it's, it's just Westmead, which isn't it's very vague, but I know it, it turned up somewhere in the 19th century. It, 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 it's a coinage that um, is associated, I think, more with the with, uh, John de Courcy and Ulster. Ulster. It shows a sort of a, a patriarchal cross. And the, uh, the words are a version or an attempt of the words Patrick or Patricia. They're called Patricks or Patricius. It's an attempt at the word Patrick and it's an attempt at a, an Episcopal cross. And I think that is dating to around, somewhere around the year 1200. And the other type of coinage that we're finding in Ireland at this point, moving through, is English coins. And this is an English coin of, I think, John or his successor, Henry III. And the English coins at this period, there's two varieties, are called short cross and long cross. That's a short cross. 
because the, the little cross in the middle of the coin doesn't come the whole way out to the edges. You can see a circle and a little cross. It's a short cross coin of King John found on a little laneway leading up to the castle in Ballymore. Again, a lot of this, for some strange reason, seems to be coming from out my own end of the county. Ballymore Castle, about 12.5, uh, 12.10. 12, now, we move on. We move on from John on to the next one up, Henry III. We're going into the 13th century, we're flying. And if you look at top right, you can see his name, H-E-N-R-I-C-U-S. Henry Cus Rex. And on top left, three strokes, three, Henry III. And that's his Irish coinage because it's in a triangle. And it's from the 1250s, 1260s. And that particular coin was, I think, found. There's a townland out one side of Loch Ennell called Newr, N-U-R-E. And I think it's around Lilliput, or the, that area. It's around Lilliput somewhere. I think that coin comes from around Lilliput. I know we found a single, a single find of Henry III from Lilliput. I think that's it. And on the back, the name of the guy who struck the coin. Go top right, D-A-V-I-D. It's David of D-I-V-E. David of Dublin struck the coin, which ended up in your Lilliput, somewhere in the 1250s. And they're still using the old triangle. Now, anyone notice anything different here? Uh, it's the next king uh, up, Henry again, but with sort of a different, different design and sort of mad eyes, and you get a lot of variation, and I wanted to just use it for that purpose. The, the H-E-N is very clear here. H-E-N, or I-C-U, is Henry Cus III, and uh, the, the triangle is still facing in the same direction. We might move on, so, to the next one. R-I-C-A-R-D, Richard on Dia, another, another Dublin coin. Now, this is the one I really wanted to get to. When you get to about the 1270s or 1280s, you're still using the old triangle, but the triangle has flipped. Pointy bit down, and it's a King Edward I. And you can actually, if you go up the top centre, you can actually read his title, E-D-W, Edward, R for Rex. He's Rex, E-N-G for England, and he's D-N-S, Dominus, H-Y-B, he's Lord of Ireland. So he's Edward, King of England, Lord of Ireland, all squashed onto that tiny little bit of information. And the triangle has slipped. Uh, I'm not sure how you would use it in mathematical terms. I only ever did past maths, so I'll just call it pointy bit down. Um, sorry, I should have used the word apex. Anyway, the, the triangle has slipped. And it's, it's, it's very interesting if you're reading all kinds of this period, maybe battered ones coming out of hordes or fines or out of rivers. If you get the triangle at all, you know it's Irish. If you get what way the triangle is facing, at least it'll pitch that coin to within 20 years for you. Oh, at this stage, they stop using the moneyer's name on the back of it, and they just give you the name of the city. Go top left, top and go on right, C-I-V-I-T-R-S, Civitas City, W. R-T-E-R-F-O-R, Fotherford, Waterford. There is a very nice penny of Edward I from Waterford. And that is of interest to us because it's one of a small hoard of this period that came to us, and as I said, I handled it myself in, I think, the 80s, from a town town called Ballykinroe. And Ballykinroe is near enough, I think it's just west of Balnagore. It's in the vicinity Ballykinroe, the, the, the postal address, I would say, is Balnagor. It's, it's very near Balnagor. I know I'm out of my own patch here. I don't know, this, I don't know the fields anymore. But Ballykinroe is around Balnagor. And we found a very nice little hoard of coins from Ballykinroe. Uh, six or seven English and two or three Irish. And that's one of the Irish ones. And uh, coins are being minted not just in Dublin, but also in Waterford, and that's a very, a very nice example. And when you look at it, okay, when your eye gets used to looking at it, it is very clear for 1280s, 1290s. You can see the Waterford bit very, very clearly. Now, also at this point, uh, that particular one is, is, is just thrown in as an example. We don't have initially, or at certain periods, we don't have halfpennies. So how do you get a halfpenny? You chop a penny in two and get a halfpenny. So hence your 
halfpenny, quite literally. So there's quite, quite an amount of coins from this period. Chopped, ha chopped coins for halfpennies, chop it again, and you have a farthing. Farthing being fjorting, uh, Viking, Viking language, four things. Uh, you have a penny for the full coin, chop it, half penny, chop it again, you have a farthing. And the, by the way, that cross which you see there, we've now gone from a short cross to what they call a long cross. The cross is going right out to the edge. And uh, the long cross facilitated, um, facilitated the chopping of the coins. So you're getting pennies, halfpennies, and farthings. And uh, if you need small change, it's very easy to arrange it. Those are quite, quite common uh, to find those chopped pieces. Now, I'm not sure, Bally Kilroe, the one that I just mentioned, I think it's all whole coins. The Ballymore find was whole coins, but you do find halves and bits and bobs coming up as part of bigger holes. Now, um, that moves us on to a, a later period where the next 150 years, you'll be glad to know that I have nothing much to say till about 1500 because there's a quiet century and a half or so when there's nothing much happening. The Dublin, the Norman, uh, should we say, pale or area has been pushed back. There has been a major re re particularly of this area around where we are at the minute, where the Gagans and the Foxes and the Shunnocks and all the other Gaelic families kind of uh, pushed back, should we say, the Norman hold. And the Norman great Norman families that were here became increasingly hibernicized. So you have the, what are known as the big three Ds, Daltons, Dillons, and Delamers. And you also have the Chutes, Eugens, and Pettits, as in Pettits would. Uh, you have, all those great big families have, have, should we say, gone native to some degree. And the story of coinage seems to die out a bit. There's nothing much happening. You also have the Black Death, of course, which it didn't help because that cut down on numbers and uh, the, 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 health, the health of the, the, the Anglo-Norman, the, the colony sort of was, was not, in every sense of the word, wasn't great. Some beautiful coins, but just a few examples. I don't have any from this county. This is coins issued in Dublin in the period from say between 1460 and 1500. Some beautiful coins. And we've now gone, we've jumped to type as well because up to now we're just dealing with pennies. Now we're dealing with groats. A groat is fourpence. So the, 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 your, coin is, your, your main coin is now gone from one to four, four pence, groat. And some, some beautiful coins, beautiful design. This is sewn on cross and so on. You get various designs of coins issued in Dublin under Edward the, Edward the Fourth and I think the, maybe early years of Henry VII, 40, the late 15th century. But I don't have any examples for the county. I'm just throwing them in just to show what they look like. And you, you also get the odd stray. We won from somewhere out around uh, Cool Amber, sorry, Cool Amber. I think it's Westmead Longford border, yeah. Cool Amber. It's out that road. And um, one or two of them turned up there. We found examples of Scottish coins. Um, Sc Scottish coins have also turned up in Ireland, not in great numbers. But the odd one would turn up in small change or turn up al alongside English material. Uh, I think the silver quality would have been fairly somewhat similar. The, a lot of the Scottish coins are, are at one point are quite different in that the royal head or face, as you can see, is in profile. It's sideways on rather than facing on. That's a, a Scottish groat, I think. And with the groat, you're getting two or three lines of uh, legend as well. You're getting Latin legends and you're getting the name, play, name, place names as well. That's a coin saw called, uh, they're called, they're farthings and halfpennies issued in the oh, late, late 15th. And uh, that is supposed to be St. Patrick. They're called, Pat, uh, and you can see this, the P-A-T of Patrick. They're f farthings and halfpennies, low, quality, low denomination material uh, minted in Dublin. Go through. That's another example. And you actually can see the Patrick quite clearly on that one. And the mitre on his head. It's the classical St. Patrick. And a small change issued in Dublin. Don't have any examples for the county, so we'll just go through them. Yeah, OK. Three crowns, also Dublin issues. Go ahead. And flip. Now, this leads to our next 
major um, period of interest. There's only this three left. Um, Henry VIII and the Tudor reconquest of Ireland. Henry VIII um, got married in, I think, the early 16th century, but didn't get around to issuing a coinage for Ireland until, I think, it was 1634. And when he did, it's a groat again. It's a crowned harp. And as far as I know, this is the first use of the harp on an Irish coin, the first known use of the harp as an Irish symbol. It's the crowned harp of Henry VIII. And uh, the hoards there, sorry, I should be reading all of this. Um, that hoard of at least 20 coins was found round Loch Ennell. Sorry, round Loch Ole, not Loch Ennell, Loch Ole this time, around the year 1900. I happen to find spot, but a good friend of mine in England who was a, a big coin dealer, sadly no longer with us, a man by the name of Pat Finn. Um, Pat Finn uh, was an English coin dealer with Westmead connections, and any time he found anything of interest, as he went through his working life, he used to tip me off. And one of the tip-offs was a hoard found around 1900 at Loch Ole of Henry VIII. And Henry VIII is interesting for several reasons. One is the advent of the harp, the crowned harp, very important. Secondly, Henry VIII, for much of the early years of his life, he is called Henry Dominus Hibernia. He was Lord of Ireland. He was King of England, but he was just Lord of Ireland. It's a slightly lesser title, but that's important. And because the title was Dominus, the coins were nicknamed, certainly in this part of the country, Dominics, you know, uh, Somebody found a few Dominics. So th those are the coins of, of Henry VIII. And um, now I'm going to rest for a minute. Um, the other thing to note about him is that to the left and right of the harp, H for Henry on the left, A on the right. He, in a case of really serious misjudgment, he put the initial of his wife on. That one is Henry with Anne Boleyn, 1630s. Now, she got the chop, should we say, quite early on. And the next one up, Henry and A. Catherine of Aragon didn't get on at all, so she's gone. Uh, Anne Boleyn is Henry and A. The next one up was Henry with Jane Seymour. Uh, so it's Henry H and J. The fourth one, one called Anne of Cleves, she only lasted less than a year. She got divorced. She doesn't turn up. The next one, num wife number five, was a woman called Catherine Howard. And he put H and K for Henry and Catherine. So as most of the wives that came along, he put his initial on the left, the wife's initial on the right. And the guys in the mint must have been going crazy because they never were sure from one <laughs> time to another what wife they were getting. Uh, Henry, Catherine Howard, he took her head off, literally. And the last poor old wife, one called Catherine Parr, survived him, and she didn't get her name on at all. And she was probably quite relieved. She was keeping her head down. Um, so those coins will take you up to about 1540. Henry with Anne, Henry with Jane, Henry with Kay. And you, keep, you can check them out as each wife comes along. And then sometime around 1641, he got royally peed off with this, and he dispensed with this idea altogether. He had enough, and so had the mint. And he just put HR, Henricus Rex. He just put his own title left and right. And as I say, the last poor, the last lucky lady never got her name and title on at all. Okay. That's the, that's the reverse of the, of the same coin. Those are groats or fourpences. It's Henry VIII. It tells us something about his royal titles. It tells us about the advent of the harp as an Irish symbol. It tells us a little bit about his love life. All on a coin from Loch Ennell, from Loch Owen. Ah, that's um, the other one. That's um, Henry with uh, H-I. I and J are the same. Henry with Jane Seymour. And the back, yeah. And that's the lad himself. You can see why he had six wives. <laughs> that, and the back, yeah. Uh, it's repeated again. The next one up, Philip and Mary. Uh, just throw them in because they're still using the Irish harp 
on a specifically Irish coinage. And Philip and Mary, Philip gave his name, of course, to Philipstown, which is Danyan, and Mary gave her name to Maryborough, which is Port Leisha. And that was during this period that the two counties of Leisha and Offaly uh, were shaped and set up as counties and called Queen's County and King's County. Queen's County being for Mary, and King's County being for Philip. Philipstown was Danyan, and Maryborough was um, Port Leash. And uh, Westmead got robbed of Plumite Noise. P and M, Philip and Mary. And note the crown harp again. This becomes a symbol for hundreds of years now as a symbol of authority, the crown above the harp. Elizabeth. And her material, 1561. Still using the harp, but this time it, it looks more like a, is it a monster rugby slogan or something. There's a couple of little harps there. But that's Queen Elizabeth using the harp as well. Now, a lot of this material, now, when we get into Elizabeth, a lot of this material is turning up in um, hordes that you don't, hordes with dates on them as late as 1620 or 1630. In other words, you will find a hoard of material with a late coin, say 1640, but you'll find coins in it going back to Elizabeth and Mary. James the First, uh, a couple of his coins have been found out around Belvedere. I, I have a reference to a Belvedere find of, of James the First, but I don't have much info on it, but I know they have been found at Belvedere. And the harp again with a different design. So this crowned harp has now taken over as the symbol, which will stay with us right through the rest of the Irish coin under the English and later British dispensation. Ah, now we're into the good stuff. The next great unsettled period is the mid 17th century. And that is the, the rebellion of 1641 and the Cromwellian Wars that followed. And from that, we've got a couple of wonderful hordes. And that's the first of them. It's a horde of English and Spanish coins and a lovely gold ring from Cherry Island, Loch Ennell. And the Cherry Island hoard, we've already published it uh, within the last year in our, that volume, Year V. And the latest coin date is 1640. The rebellion that breaks out is 1641. So there is every possibility that the coin hoard deposited on Cherry Island is related in some fashion to the rebellion of 1641 and the, the wars that followed. Uh, the, the ring says, in constancy I live and die. So we don't know who lived or how they died, but whoever it was never got back to Cherry Island to reclaim their hoard. And there's 58 coins there I think over 50 of them, 51 of them English, vast majority silver, but a few gold, a few lovely gold coins. Um, the, the gold coin on the bottom left here is a, is a pound. It's called a laurel, but it is a, catcher, it's a pound coin. And if you look behind the king's ear, there's two X's, XX, 20. 20 shillings a pound. So it, it's telling you what the denomination is. Two X's. Um, it's a pound coin. And that turned up on Cherry Island uh, in a hoard of uh, almost 60 coins. We don't know who put it there. There's absolutely no way. Someone going to war, maybe hiding from war, fleeing from war, hiding it from a, a threatening army. Westmead was destroyed during the Cromwellian period by rival armies marching to and fro. And particularly because of the fact that the, the main gateway to Connacht was at loan. So any, nearly any, any army that left Dublin was going to come through Kinnegad. And in Kinnegad, you had a choice of to go the Galway Road or the Mullingar Road, uh, which they did. And the same thing holds for the Williamite period. Uh, any invading army coming through Middle Ireland heading for at loan is going to come through Westmead. So we don't know what that's about. Well, well in turn, we know what it's about, but who hid it or why or when? But it has to be 1640s. And the gold coins are really beautiful. And it's a rather poignant thing to find a gold ring as well. Somebody put that gold ring there, which says, in constancy, I live and die. And we don't know who they were, where they came from. It could be one of the Gagans. It could be one of the Daltons. It could be one of the 
the Anglo-Norman families. It could be one of the families that got cleared out by Cromwell a few years later. Okay. That's more of the same. That's the gold coin. Go ahead, yeah. That's another gold, gold coin. Again, two X's at the back is 20. 20 shillings a pound, that's it. And, uh, In constancy, I live and die. I ran it through to see, was it a motto of, say, the Foxes or the Gagans or the Dilla Daltons or the, you know, could I pin it to a family? But I couldn't. But apparently it's a fairly common motto on 17th century rings. And it turns up, I think, in Shakespeare and Hamlet and other places. So it was a, it was a, a wordage of the time. And also... The other side of exotic, we were getting exotic earlier on with the stuff coming from the Middle East. That's a, this is a Spanish coin. Spanish and uh, French, Portuguese, silver circulated widely. So you get straight, the straight English and Spanish coins, sorry, Spanish and Portuguese coins as well. That's what's known as a piece of eight. It's, a, it's a, a, do, a Spanish dollar, essentially. And it was minted in a place called Segovia, I think. Um, in Spain, and the date is on it, and the king's name is on it. And what's common enough in 17th century horse is to find, because there was such a shortage of coinage, foreign coinage circulated with the English and Irish stuff. It's just, just interesting to find a Spanish coin working its way all the way to Cherry Island, which is on the, the south side of Loch Island there, near, uh, uh, where is it, near Robinstown. Uh, material from the Civil War, from the 1640s. I don't have that coin from Westmead, I don't think. Material going through. Uh, and just mention this in passing because it, it really is it's, it's not particularly relevant, but the only gold coins ever minted in Ireland, the only gold coins known to have been minted in Ireland are called pistoles. And that's an example. Um, there is no denomination on it, but you work by weight. Four, four uh, Four penny weights and seven grains. Now, I'm gone a bit rusty on penny weights and grains. They're all subdivisions of the ounce, but I used to know it at one time, but I don't need to know it now, so I don't. Um, the only gold coins minted in Ireland, a few examples have turned up. I think there's about half a dozen in the museum. Uh, last one I saw go at auction went for 80 grand, so if anyone comes across one, give us a shout. Silver coins from the same period. A lot of the, a lot of this period, from, a lot of the coins from this period, Cromwellian period, emergency material. It's rough and it's ready, and that's a, that's a half crown, two and six, two shillings and six pence. S and D, two shillings, six pence, half a crown, old money. Now, uh, yes, just just a quick aside before we go to our last five minutes, which is the gun money of the 1690s. Um, one hoard that I just want to mention because it's not here. It's just worth a quick mention because the story is so interesting. There was a huge hoard found in the nine, around 1911, the 1911 census or way back around there, from a place called Paddenstown. Now Paddenstown is out at the bottom end of my own parish. It's in the parish of Milltown. And there was supposed to be 700 coins found, four or five stone weight of silver and gold found at Paddenstown. I could never, I spent a long time trying to find, check, crack it, and then we found a reference that took me to a journal. Then I found a reference that took me to a journal in 1911. And then I found that half of the coins had been purchased by a gentleman called James Chute. And James Chute was the MP for Westmead in pre-independence time, a very well-known figure. He was also an antiquarian and a historian and a very learned fellow. And I'll just read it. It's easier to read it. Recently, while a labouring man was tilling his plot in Paddenstown, about seven miles from Mullingar, he dug up a large hoard of silver coins, mostly Edward VI, Mary, Elizabeth, James I and Charles, 700 in all. That's the sort of material that we've just been looking at from Cherry Island. That sort of material. The coins were discovered at a depth of two feet. It would appear that the covering of cloth had enclosed, had entirely gone. Um, there is a tradition in the neighbourhood that up to 100 years ago, a castle of the Daltons was in this area. Now, it would make perfect sense because the Daltons were the big... The barony of... Sorry, before I go... 
into the story. Uh, there is a, a, both a barony and a parish and a townland and a village out there, which people in modern Ireland tend to call Rathcon Rath, but the real name is Rakondra. Um, and out around Rakondra, um, they found that the, the, this was the, it was in the barony or area of Rakondra. In the old days, that barony was known as Dalton's Country. And it would make perfect sense that a hoard material would be found that related to the Daltons because they would be one of the families, one of the old uh, families cleared out during the Cromwellian clearances. There was a tradition that there was a castle of the Daltons, but I purchased 320 of the coins. And he said the remainder were purchased by a gentleman living near Rakondra. Sorry, I know it says Ratconrath, but I can't say Ratconrath. That's grand. Uh, we were trying to find out more about this. And a friend of mine gave me a good clue. She said, check the Folklore Commission. And I went into the Folklore Commission. Folklore Commission went to 1936, 37, 38, when they went round to all the national schools in Ireland and got the senior children to bring in stories from their parents, collecting stories about history and myth and cures and all the rest of it. And it's a, a gold mine. But this was a particular gold mine because in the Folklore Commission I found an essay from a young lady called Abigail Hedgewan. Balan Chu, Balan the 1938, a story from her own father. Thomas, quote, Thomas Noonan found about four stone weight of silver coins and a few gold coins. He was living in a cottage built on the site of an old castle. One day he was ploughing the garden and the plough caught a big rock and out under the rock he found all of those coins. Um, there was a lot of coins and a lot of mould, as she calls it. Right. And the area she mentions is Paddenstown. They were made in the time of Queen Elizabeth, spot on. And there won several dates, including 1585 and 1603. Ties in exactly with what Mr. Jude said. He sold some of the coins to Mr. Mayers of Mayers Court, who went over to London and sold them, probably at a very nice profit, I bet. He gave some of them to some of the people in the neighborhood. There are none of the Nonans there living today. They lived in Paddenstown, about three miles from Paddenstown. So the Folklore Commission in 1938 backs up what James Chute says. And we know that now there was 700 coins found at Paddenstown. James Chute took 320 of them. Mr. Mayors of Mayorscourt, Mayorscourt is adjoining Paddenstown, it's beside it, got presumably bought the rest of them and brought them to London and sold them. Where he sold them, I don't know. I've never been able to put that hoard together. But I did find that Mr. Chute died in 1916, and in his will, he had, he had no immediate direct descendants. He had no sons or daughters to leave all his uh, bits and bobs to. So his stuff, a lot of it went up for auction. Some of it here in St. Mary's Hall in Mullingar, some of it in an auction room in Dublin. And Mr. Chute stipulated in his will that 300 euro go, 300 euro, 300 pounds go to the building of the new cathedral. The funds were already happening at that time. Another couple of hundred pounds for the looking after infirm and aged priests. And he stipulated that the rest of the money from the sale of his cabinets and his curios, including his coins, should go for setting up an endowment or a prize fund for any child, boy or girl, from any school, Catholic or Protestant, who showed the best interest in Irish history. So James Chute set up a history prize, and he did it on the back of at least a coin hoard from Paddenstown. I'd never heard of this prize fund, I'd never heard of this um, prize, the Chute Endowment, whatever it was, but one of the people here this evening has, and we'll, we'll talk about it later. So this prize fund 
Rose Ealing worked it, knows about it, has heard it, and it, it did take foot and got going and uh, existed for many years. I don't think it exists anymore. But Mr. Chute died and his coins were sold at an auction in Dublin. I found that as well in his... My medals and coins and so on to be sold by Bennett and Sons, Ormond Quay, in the middle of January 1917. I'm still chasing that bit of information. So there we have it. A coin hoard from Paddenstown, 700 of them. Gone to, uh, some to London, some to Dublin, and some to fund a prize fund for the best uh, Irish history student in West Maine. Okay. The, the, so I'm just going to get through to the last one. I'm aware of time. Just from this period also, there are, as well as coins, we have tokens. Uh, uh, merchants and traders in places like Mullingar and at Lowell, and even little villages like Four and even Ballymore issued their own tokens in the 1670s because of the shortage of coins. That, um, that, well, yeah, that particular one is Athlone, a man called Fallon in Athlone. And sometimes you get Athlone spelt A-T-H-L-O-N, sometimes A-T-H-L-O-N-E. They're little farthing pennies and halfpennies issued by merchants and traders. Uh, and uh, they're lovely little do historical documents in their own right. And Mullingar has the honour of having... I don't have an example of it here, I couldn't get it in time, but what I think is are the only rhyming tokens in this period of the 17th century. There are a lovely little token from Mullingar. I can't remember the name of the issuer, but you have to read it from one side to the other, and you need a good Midland accent. It says, these tokens are for Mullingar. <laughs> and uh, they were issued in the 1670s. Right, we'll go on to the gun money and get finished before I tire everyone out. Yes. Uh, also, a few St. Patrick's coins as well. Uh, there was also tokens issued by Dublin Corporation, and one of them, I only could ever, one of them came up about 20 or 30 years ago with a fine place in Delvin. I tried to buy it, but my boss shot me down at the time, miserable old, whatever. Um, I tried to buy it from Delvin because you don't normally find them outside Dublin. It's a Dublin issue of a to Dublin Corporation issued a token coinage called St. Patrick's. And there's a beautiful example of. I think it's David playing the harp. We'll go to the next. Ah, there he is, the man himself. St. Patrick with his mitre and his crozier. And if you look at the bottom, the little wriggly lads, he's driving out the snakes. <laughs> As St. Patrick, I think that's the halfpenny. Uh, St. Patrick's token coinage from the 1670s. And that uh, an example came, as I say, at least one example come from Delvin, but I, I, I failed, I should have bought him myself, but I didn't. Anyway, you can see carefully at the bottom there, the little wriggly fellas, he's uh, in the business of driving out the snakes just there. And it's, again, it's one of the earliest depiction, you know, stories of Patrick and the snakes. There were those who said that he didn't drive them all out. Um, <laughs> same again. <coughs> Go ahead. Oh yeah, there's, oh yeah, you get a better class of snake on that one. Yeah, I don't know. Oh yeah, foreign coins. A lot of foreign coins have circulated as well from this period, and some of them from the 1690s. I just want to get to the 1690s. Yeah, uh, yes, here we are. Um, in the 1690s, our last story for the night, we have the advent of the James versus William and the Battle of the Boyne and siege of Athlone. <coughs> and all of that. And that's really the end of our story because I'm not going into the 18th century. It's a grim time, very little in the way of hoards. I think those who had money didn't need to hoard it um, because there was a the new ascendancy came in and were established, didn't need to hoard. The poor people didn't have anything to hoard. The 18th century is a bit dead for us. So I'm cutting off with the Battle of the Boyne or thereabouts. And the story here, for Westmead anyway, and the Siege of Athlone and all of that is gun money. James II was penniless, and he had this brainwave that he would issue a, a sort of a token coinage to be re retrieved later when he'd won the war, but of course he didn't. And uh, he, he brought out a coinage in brass and copper and base metal, every form of metal he could lay his hands on, even, even old, old cannons and guns, hence the term gun money. It was made literally from whatever metal he could find. And he brought out to see a whole coinage of crowns, half crowns, shillings, and sixpences. And his unfortunate followers and soldiers were paid with this CRAP. And <coughs> merchants and traders would have also had to, I presume, accept it in areas under his control. Okay. Anno Domini, 1690. Uh, it's a token coinage. 
say the half crown, for example, the, the half crown should have been a silver coin. He, he turned it out as a brass or copper coin. Um, the metal content in it would have been probably worth a penny, but he called it a half crown. And if the king called it a half crown, you took it as a half crown. Ask King James himself, Jacobus too. And that particular example there is a sixpence. You can see the VI top center. And because he issued it as a token coinage and wanted to retrieve it, maybe later on, he put not just the year, but the month. And that's September. I think it's September 1689. You can see the SEP underneath. So this is very unusual coinage in that it has not just the year, but the month. And that from a collector's point of view, this is great fun because if you have 11 months, you want to get the 12th one and so on. But uh, it's a very poor quality coinage. And the only hoard that I'm aware of of substance from Westmead is there was a fairly substantial hoard found, maybe, I don't know, before the Second World War in out the road, Curlstown. Uh, a man came in to me in a uh, museum maybe 20, 30 years ago from Kinnegad, and his dad had found the hoard 40, 50 years earlier out at Curlstown, but he didn't have an actual fine spot. He had the town in Curlstown, but that's as close as I can get. The hoard didn't stay with me. I wanted it for the museum, but uh, he, it was of very importance to him, and I, I didn't force the issue. I left. We, we, we have trays and trays of the stuff. But because it was from Carlstown in a certain well-known county, I thought I might get it often, but you know, it, it's still out there somewhere. Now, financially, this material is not, they're, they're, you excuse the pun, they're ten a penny. But because of what they tell us about King James and his antics, it's interesting material. <coughs> They've been found at Carlstown. They've been found around the castle in Ballymore. They've been out. They've been found in stray ones I know that I've seen out around the aforementioned Racondra, we found out over the place because when the Williamites won the war, they declared that this coinage should be set at its own metal value. And I think a year or two later, they demonetized it altogether. It also became probably politically not very smart to be caught with it in your pocket at all. So people literally chucked the stuff away. It's turned up in bog holes, it's turned up on side roads. It's the gun money, one of the great antics of James II. And that's a, a gold hoard from, from the same period that snuck in, that it has no relationship to Westmead, but it made somebody very happy. And on into George II. So George I and George II. We're going into the, the, we're, we're going into the 18th century now, and basically an end of the old wealth hoards as we understand them. I just want to finish with one last bit here. Uh, this one, not Thomas. Yes. One last bit. That's more or less the end of our story in terms of Westmead and hordes. And it goes the whole way from Dyser Island to Cherry Island. It goes from Loch Lane to Loch Ole, from Ballymore to uh, Derrymore. We have a, big, a substantial fine place called Griffinstown around Kilokan that I know is from around the same period as the famous Paddenstown one, but I don't have much information on it. So that is basically the end of our story, but I just want to end because of the importance of folklore. One last letter. Um, the same James Hedgewin, who gave us our earlier story that set me off on Paddenstown, also wrote a second one uh, for the Folklore Commission. In a place near Myvor, there was a pot of gold found nearly 100 years ago. Now, he's writing in 38. 100 years ago is before the famine, you know, from going back from 38 by a farmer called John Mulvaney. He was hunting a cow out of a tillage field, and he went over to a ditch to get something to whack, well, he just to hit her with, and he pulled up a small bush, and underneath it he found a pot, a pot of gold underneath the roots. The present occupier of the farm is Michael Mulvaney, grandson of the said John Mulvaney. The pot is in the house still. This is in 1938. It is made of bronze. The place where it was found is called Putha Ore. But that was found near my war, and I'm as mad as hell that I never knew about this growing up. But anyway, I was doing a bit of checking out, and I was talking to a good friend and neighbour in Leek Slip, beside where I live, called James Hedgewood, same name as the man here. We went to school together, secondary school together, and he's from Milton, so I sent him off doing a bit of investigating for me. And he came back and was able to tell me from talking in his own family that his own father, born around 1899, 
had seen and handled the pot as a young man. So the story is that there was a pot of gold found. Now, it doesn't say gold coins, by the way, a pot of gold found before the famine, and the pot was still kicking around as late as, say, about 1920 or 1930. Uh, don't know where the contents of the pot went. Don't know anything about it. But it does show the importance of folklore and old stories. And I'm just hoping that maybe out there somewhere there's maybe a bit of extra information, um, a bit of extra information that might throw light on whether that was gold or gold coins or where they might have went. It just goes to show the importance of oral history. So that's the end of our story, except just to know that coins, if I could find my own material here. Ah, they are important indicators. They're dating agents for archaeologists. They are indicators of political and economic activity. They may signify a period of military turmoil, like the Cromwellian period and the Jim, the Willamite period. But they are, above all, above anything else, they're history in your hand. Just history in your hand, and that's why I like them. Thanks. <laughs>